Now, where were we? Ah, yes, boundary value problems, or more specifically, problems in elasticity. We've moved on from chapters one and two. I know we loved chapters one and two, but we have to actually solve problems now. We can't just sit and analyze things all day. So that's precisely what we're going to do. We're actually going to start solving some problems in elasticity. And I'm going to be particular. I'm not just going to call them problems. Uh, I'm going to call them boundary value problems. And if you watched last lecture, you understand well what that means. And if you don't yet understand what that means, uh, a bit of a refresher. Uh, first of all, you know, we've covered at least up to last lecture, some of the preliminary definitions on what are boundary conditions and what is a boundary value problem as it pertains to elasticity, the subject of this course. Uh, and in this lecture, we're going to talk more about solving particular boundary value problems in elasticity, specialized to the case of plane stress and plane strain. We defined these terms earlier when we covered some of the topics in chapter two, but we'll dive into more detail in today's lecture and solve a particular example. Uh, we'll also demonstrate a few solution approaches for how you can solve these specialized 2D boundary value problems using something called the airy stress function. It's kind of a specialized analytical solution procedure that folks have been using, oh, before they had computers to do this kind of thing. So we'll talk a little bit about that and how we can derive analytical solutions to specialized plane stress or plane strain boundary value problems uh, by way of example. And of course, we'll cover some of this other content later. But again, a, a brief refresher before we dive into specifically solving boundary value problems. What exactly do I mean when I say a boundary value problem? The operative word here is boundary. The supposition is that we've been talking about conditions that govern equilibrium, compatibility, and other constraints, uh, you know, material relationships uh, between stress and strain, all of that that we've discussed in chapters one and two only pertains to what's happening on, on the interior of some body or region. I, I'll usually call this region uh, the continuum potato, sometimes also denoted by this capital omega symbol. But really, those equations are quite general, and they apply to any such potato or object, provided that it exhibits this kind of linear elastic behavior. So what good does it do us to know that these equations hold at every point, in every continuum, everywhere in the universe? It doesn't get us any closer to solving how does a particular object deform under particular loading conditions and particular support conditions, which is why we have to define these things called boundary conditions. And boundary conditions dictate everything there is to know about the solution for the displacements, the stresses and the strains inside of the body. Just by prescribing what's happening on the boundary of the domain, we can figure out by way of the other equations that we've put forward, what's happening on the interior. So all we need to know, all we need to specify are these boundary conditions, which come in two different exciting flavors, displacement boundary conditions and traction boundary conditions. You could think of them as direct constraints on the value of displacement on certain portions of the boundary over which we're prescribing what the value of displacement should be, and traction boundary conditions, which basically say that we can impose some distributed force per unit of area on the surface of the body. And Anywhere that we have some kind of exposed surface, we have to prescribe either one of these two conditions, either a displacement boundary condition or a traction boundary condition. You have to have one or the other. However, it is possible to simply say that a traction boundary condition could be a zero traction, which implies that there's zero loading on some kind of free surface that you're not directly constraining, but which you're not also directly loading. And these conditions, these free surface conditions or constraints are equally as important as the other types of boundary conditions. So that's what we mean by boundary conditions and by a boundary value problem. We simply mean that we are now going to solve these collection of equations that we've derived from the previous chapters. 
now posed in this format, where we suppose that what we seek is the solution to some uniquely defined field, let's call it the displacement field. And the goal is to find the specific displacement field, which satisfies our governing differential equations and mechanics, which includes compatibility and includes the stress strain relationships, and it includes equilibrium at every point in the domain. We can consolidate all those things into one big equation to rule them all, the governing differential equation uh, as shown here, expressed exclusively in terms of the single unknown field, the displacements. Everything else can be represented in terms of displacement if we assume linear elastic behavior. And so it suffices to solve problems just by seeking this specific solution field. The others we can just determine by a post-processing procedure, if you like. And that's how most numerical approaches to solving these problems proceed. They express practically everything in terms of displacements, and then everything else comes kind of for free. Now, we don't just want to solve this generic equation for some generic displacement field. There are many possible displacement fields that satisfy this function. We really need to find the specific displacement field that satisfies this function and all of the boundary conditions that we might impose on a particular body, which includes the displacements and any kind of tractions imposed on the boundary. So that's a boundary value problem. And as I mentioned, there's a couple of constraints that we have to impose on how we prescribe these boundary conditions, and they're subject to certain mathematical constraints. Mathematicians, as I like to say, tend to overanalyze things, but in this particular case, they had a good point. Now, there are two primary things that you should take away from this particular chapter, which is that if we're defining a boundary value problem, really, we need two things. Ideally, this problem should have at least one solution that we can find. If it doesn't have a solution, then we're in trouble. We've, we're, we've set ourselves up for failure. It should also have a unique solution. It's not just that there should be many possible solutions. There really should only be one solution that we care about. And for a boundary value problem to be well posed, we mean that there should exist a unique solution. So existence and uniqueness characterize these two mathematical requirements for well posedness of boundary value problems, not just in elasticity, but in the solution of other types of boundary value problems more generally. That can apply in all other domains of physics. But in the particular context we're looking at, we have to satisfy a few conditions, which basically means that for our solution to exist at all, we basically have to impose constraints on how we're defining displacements and tractions. If at some location on the boundary, we say, I'm going to prescribe what the value of displacement is here in let's say the X direction. If you've done that, if you've said, at this point, I'm prescribing displacement in the X direction. You cannot also, at that same location, prescribe what the traction component should be in that same X direction. To do so would violate this condition of solution existence because it would be equivalent to effectively defining what the support reaction should be at a particular constrained point on the boundary of the body. You can't impose displacement equals zero, and also say what the reaction force should be there. If you tried to solve any kind of problem in statics where you said what the reaction force was before you even solved what the reactions were, you'd be setting yourself up for failure. You can't dictate both displacement and traction at the same location in the same coordinate direction. So it's important that we not introduce any of these conflicting constraints. We can define either displacement or traction at different parts of the body, but not at the same locations. And that's crucial. We'll have some exercises that kind of quiz you on this in a moment. So do pay attention. It'll, it's coming on the next slide. Now, the other condition, solution uniqueness, basically dictates that if we're going to have a unique solution, we really need two things. First, if we're solving problems in mechanics, it makes sense that we should fully constrain the body against rigid motion. If we put some loads on a body, and it were allowed to, I don't know, float away. Certainly, there are any number of configurations as the body's floating where it maintains a state of force equilibrium as it's kind of drifting through space. But 
there's no unique solution for where it actually sits in the universe. It could just be, you know, any number of different configurations as it's kind of traversing this linear trajectory in outer space or something. Now, the other condition for solution uniqueness is that we actually have to say that anywhere on the boundary, and rather everywhere on the boundary, we have to define some prescription of what either the displacement is or the traction is on that part of the boundary. So every stinking point on the boundary has to have some prescribed boundary condition. It could be a displacement, it could be a traction, it could even be a zero traction indicating that it's a free surface, but you have to be explicit. If you're not fully describing what's happening on the boundary, then there are many possible solutions which satisfy those boundary conditions, except for maybe some hole, which could contain some important features like maybe there's a load there, maybe there's no load there. But if you're not being specific about that, then you won't have a unique solution. So you have to define boundary conditions everywhere on the boundary. All right, now enough of the theory and the math. Let's try an exercise and I'll invite you to participate amongst each other, discuss, you know, maybe in small teams or groups, which of the following six boundary conditions defined on this small two-dimensional patch will satisfy these aforementioned conditions of solution existence and uniqueness. Take a minute, maybe take a couple minutes, discuss amongst yourselves and then we'll revisit this. Go ahead. It's okay to ask questions if you need a little clarification on exactly what do I mean by these things. If you need a refresher, take a brief moment to review. Solution existence really is this. Don't define a force at the same place where you're kind of constraining a displacement. And I'm re representing nominally locations where I'm constraining displacement by these blue hatched regions or even through these you know, classical pin and roller constraints by prescribing maybe what's the normal displacement or both normal and tangential displacements at a given point. And then also I have some, you know, maybe some concentrated forces thrown in there for fun and then a bunch of other distributed forces. But the idea is we want to really find, you know, which, which of these constitutes this over constraint condition. Yeah, yeah. All right. It sounds like some some of you have come to some conclusions. Let's go ahead and collectively go through this one by one. So we'll kind of do our usual. Let's vote. You know, yes, yay or nay. Does it satisfy existence and uniqueness, or no thumbs down if it doesn't? Yeah. Okay. So number one, who says that it satisfies both 
solution existence and uniqueness, we got at least one confident, you know, yes. <laughs> the two confident yeses. Any other takers? Yes, a few in, in the back, I think. Okay. Well, I'll say this, I, you know, it might be confusing if you saw this cannot constrain or, you know, I use the terminology over constraint or you can't impose too many constraints on the problem. Otherwise, you know, the, you won't have a solution at all. Uh, but I will give this away. This one is in fact, a valid boundary value problem that satisfies, you know, the well-posedness requirements of his existence and uniqueness. It looks a little different maybe from what you're familiar with because we're really constraining a lot of displacements on the boundary here, but there's nothing that says we can't do this. There's nothing that says we couldn't fully prescribe what the displacements are on the boundary of a thing. It'd be kind of hard to construct this, you know, situation in reality, but it's not an invalid, well-posed boundary value problem. So even though we're constraining a lot of displacements, it doesn't really matter. As long as we're not defining conflicting boundary conditions, as long as we're not specifying forces in addition to displacements at the same point, it's totally fine. And we're obviously fully prescribing all the displacements on the boundary. So we're defining everything everywhere all at once. Okay, cool. Now, what about number two? Who says yes? Oh, confident knows. Yes, I love your confident. Uh, who, who's, uh, who's a yes on this one? Oh, you're kind of gravely shaking your head. What about the no's? Who says no? Yeah, okay. A, a lot of no's on this one. I think, well, you're right, absolutely. Because, you know, I'll, I'll let you tell me. Why, number two? Why not? Yeah, it's it's not... It could just move if we let it go. Uh, and assuming the forces weren't perfectly in equilibrium. So there's no unique solution. It could be here, it could be drifted anywhere, and it would still be in a state of equilibrium. It would satisfy all the other equations that we've defined. So it, it doesn't give us a unique solution. So that's why two is no go. What about number three? Who says yes to number three? Oh, some hesitancy. Who says no? A lot of no's, okay, well, that's good actually. I would say no here as well. And the reason? Over constrained. Yes, I've been hearing a lot of it. We're constraining both displacement and force at the same location in the same direction. So at this pin support where we're constraining both vertical and translational, you know, uplift and sliding, we're also trying to impose what's the support reaction in that direction, which is, incompatible with our definition of having a solution even exists. So it violates existence. Okay, what about this one? It's sort of similar. It's almost the same. We've just swapped which one was the roller and which one was the pin. So what do you think? Satisfies solution existence? Maybe, I, yeah, I like, I like the fact that on this one, it's not as clear. Uh, who says no, doesn't satisfy it? Kind of le less clear, not as much confidence this time, but I think it's warranted. I, you know, even when I was putting this one together, I kind of thought to myself, maybe, maybe not. It's kind of open to interpretation because this is okay. This is certainly okay to do because we're not directly constraining the vertical, you know, uplift here. So, or rather we are constraining vertical uplift. We're just not constraining the tangential displacement or the displacement in the X direction. So it's okay to put a force there, that's good. But what about this corner? Uh, it's really open to interpretation as to how exactly you define this traction boundary condition. It really depends. You could define it almost everywhere except for this point, and that would be okay. But if you tried to, let's say, define the traction at this like corner perfectly, and also constrain the displacement there, then it wouldn't qualify as a well-posed boundary value problem. So it's good. You, you're kind of, I like the way you're thinking because I think that's exactly right. This one really depends on the precision with which you define these boundary conditions. Okay. Oh, now what about number five? Well posed or not? Ah, a lot of no's. Yeah, yeah. And why not? It can't move to the right, you say? or it could move to the right. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, it, it kind of depends on your interpretation of this roller here. I, th I think if you were to allow vertical uplift, if this was truly a roller, 
where there really should be the allowance that this could just like pop off this support, then you're right. It would basically violate in ill-constrained condition. But let's just, for the sake of example, maybe tweak this a little bit and say that, I don't know, somehow this is a magical roller that allows uh, some kind of like tensile stress to develop in this support condition. So it actually prevents uplift in this direction. What, what about then? Then it rotates. It could potentially rotate. And that's exactly the situation that you might have in this support constraint condition. You really only have two reaction forces that would be generated from these supports, which if you remember your statics, you only have two reaction forces to try to constrain you know, sum of forces acting on this whole thing in the X, Y, and moment. You know, those are three equilibrium conditions, but only two reaction forces to try to enforce that, which basically means you're not going to be able to prevent the rotation from happening. So in fact, number five is ill-posed it, because it doesn't have enough support constraints. Very similar to this problem, just in the case that this thing might ultimately rotate. And I invite you to kind of ponder exactly how that might happen. Maybe this support would move up at the same time that this support would move inward, and the whole thing might kind of rotate at that same time, or it might go the other direction. One of the two. All right, number six. What about this one? Looks a little different, but to clarify some of the imagery here, suppose that these are just collections of rollers that potentially prevent, like our magical roller here, prevents this thing from uplift. So it's, you know, it basically allows tangential sliding relative to the surface, but disallows separation. So it could carry a tensile stress along that interface. In that case, would you say that number six is well posed? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. In this case, you know, we're fully prescribing what's happening on these boundaries. And it's kind of assumed also that, you know, on these free surfaces, obviously, we're prescribing zero traction. That's kind of implied through a lot of these diagrams. If we're not directly saying what the traction is on a surface, you know, it, it basically implies that there is zero traction on that surface. But indeed, this one is fully constrained. It won't rotate, assuming there's no uplift from either of these. And you know, it certainly won't translate. And there's no conflicting constraints, unless maybe we have a similar situation here as we do here. Although even if that were the case, it would still be fine because this roller is not actually constraining tangential motion. So it's okay to prescribe attraction on that bottom corner. Okay, you all did very well. So hopefully uh, this reaffirms your intuition. This is the kind of problem that I think would be fun to include on like the midterm or something. So it's a good thing to review, a good thing to kind of practice and just imagine different boundary conditions and well-posedness constraints. Okay, so we've talked all about boundary conditions and boundary value problems and how they're defined and what happens if we have a well-posed boundary value problem versus an ill-posed boundary value problem. Now, let's actually start solving a few specific boundary value problems. And it's useful to look at a couple of uh, generic classes of boundary value problems for two dimensions. So two-dimensional problems could look like one of these two different situations in general. And by two-dimensional problem in elasticity, I really mean that there should really only be some dependence on what's happening in the x and y directions. And then with respect to the z direction, maybe we don't really care what's going on. And to give you an illustration of what some of those situations might look like in real life, it's illustrated to consider the case of plain strain on the left versus plain stress. Two nominally, you know, two-dimensional versions of elasticity, but they actually come with a few different assumptions. So plain strain is essentially the condition where we say that maybe we have some domain, it has some finite length, you know, along the z direction, but at the end caps of this domain, assuming it's prismatic and assume, assuming whatever loading or other boundary conditions we impose on the boundary of this cylinder, let's say, or this prism, assuming that they're, they don't vary with respect to the Z coordinate, and assuming that we have these two end caps where we prevent displacement in the Z direction entirely, then it suffices to approximate 
this situation by saying, well, Z displacement, not just at the end caps, but everywhere through this prism should be zero, which consequently leads to this condition. Also that the strain in the Z direction, the longitudinal strain along the axis of this member is gonna be zero. Obviously this thing can't elongate or can't shrink. We're kind of fixing it in that direction. So displacement all along the length is zero and the strain, it, it doesn't elongate along the Z direction. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that the stress along that same axial coordinate is going to be zero. If we're confining this cylinder and maybe we're, I don't know, pressurizing the exterior of it, it would want to elongate, but if we're confining it, in order to confine it, we would need to impose some kind of, you know, stress on the ends to prevent it from extending, which implies that the Z stress or the stress along the axis of this prism may not necessarily be zero. And in general, it won't be zero. So we can look at this problem of plane strain kind of like this cylindrical representation. But if we assume that there's really no dependence on things happening in the Z dimension anyways, we could just choose to take a particular cut through the prism and just say, well, let's just examine what's happening on that one kind of representative cut and treat everything as an equivalent two-dimensional representation of this problem. So one way that you can define a two-dimensional problem in elasticity under these kind of assumed end cap of a you know, prism under uniform loading that has no variation with respect to the Z direction. The other situation that is probably more physical and happens more frequently in real life is the case of plane stress, which is sort of the opposite of plane strain. Rather than having, let's say, a long cylinder that's confined at its end caps, suppose you had, I, I don't know, a continuum potato chip. Maybe one slice of this cylinder kind of taken out of this body and which has a relatively small thickness dimension. So its dimension in the Z direction is very, very small compared to its in-plane dimensions in the X and Y direction. For these types of problems, and assuming that you're only applying in-plane loading conditions, so you're only applying loads that act in the x or y directions and only applying constraints in the x and y directions. In general, if you assume that that free surface, the surface of the continuum potato ship on the front and back face, if there's no loads applied to it, then really there's no traction applied to that surface either, which implies that there's no traction on that face. There's no normal stress component or stress in the Z direction out of the plane of this page. So we can rightly enforce this boundary condition that the ZZ stress on these outer faces is completely equal to zero. In fact, it's not just the ZZ stress that's zero, but in also you know, the shear components of stress that act on those outward facing uh, cuts of this continuum potato chip. So ZZ stress, is zero and the other components of shear traction that would act on those open faces are also zero. But importantly, if we're supposing that this thin plate is allowed to, I don't know, stretch in plane, then really there's nothing preventing, I don't know, this plate from maybe getting a little bit thinner if we stretch it in one direction due to Poisson's effect, which implies that maybe there won't be any normal stress to the plate but there may yet be some normal strain through the thickness. So it might shrink in terms of its overall thickness as you stretch it in different directions, which further implies that the displacement in the Z direction through the thickness is also potentially non-zero. Okay, so all those things hold, but in general, components of shear strain and shear stress, with the exception of the in-plane shear strain and stress in the XY plane, all of those other components will be zero. So we can reduce most of the problem's description into these kind of simplified two-dimensional uh, descriptors. Now, some refresher on the relationships between different constitutive variables. So between strain and stress, we had two ways of relating stresses and strains. One was this forward relationship, where if we assume we knew what the strain was in the body, then we could then find out what the stress was. And in the case of either plane strain or plane stress, we could define those relationships in the same way, just by saying, well, let's say we have, you know, these in-plane values of strain and also shear strain. 
And we suppose that the other values of strain, shear strain, and such aren't really relevant for solving these two-dimensional problems. So we can define our constitutive relationships in a way that looks like this. We can define the relationship between stresses and strains just by kind of directly pushing forward all these values. The one caveat to all this is in the case of plain stress, where I said, maybe it's the case that the stress through the thickness, the Z stress, is going to be zero, but we can't say anything about what the Z strain is. It's unknown. We, we don't really know what it is, but for the purpose of plain stress problems, uh, I'll just say, don't know, don't care. I mean, we could figure out what it is. We could certainly use our constitutive relationship and in fact, pick off this one last equation that says that the Z stress should be zero. And in terms of the other components of in-plane strain, we can figure out what that Z strain is. So we, we could figure it out if we wanted to, but oftentimes it's convenient to just condense out that representation of Z strain and come up with an equivalent plane stress representation of the relationship between strain and stress expressed exclusively in terms of the in-plane components of longitudinal strain. So if I know, let's say the in-plane components of epsilon XX and epsilon YY, then I can figure out epsilon ZZ just through my constitutive relationship. And then I can plug it back in and come up with this you know, modified version of the stress-strain relationship, now just in terms of these two-dimensional longitudinal strain quantities. So a simplified way of doing this whole procedure. And the shear strain and the shear stress are related as they normally are. And it's the same regardless of whether you're looking at a plane strain or plane stress relationship. It's totally the same relationship. Now, the reverse, going in the reverse direction. Suppose you had stress and now you wanted strain. Now the situation is flipped. It's a little bit easier in the case of plane stress because we say, oh, well, we know that the ZZ stress is zero, so I can just use my standard inverse constitutive relationship, plug in all these values with ZZ stress equals zero, and then I can find out what the in-plane longitudinal strain should be. And in the case of plane strain, now we have to do that same trick that we did in the case of plane stress when we were trying to figure out stresses given strains. Here, we don't know what the ZZ stress is. So we can't directly solve this problem unless we figure it out. We can do that just by enforcing the condition that ZZ strain equals zero, and then figure out what is ZZ stress in terms of the other in-plane longitudinal stresses. And it involves some dependence on the Poisson's ratio. Now, we can, again, do that same trick. We can consolidate out that dependence on the ZZ stress and reduce it into this equivalent two-dimensional plane strain constitutive relationship going in the opposite direction. Given in-plane longitudinal stress, figure out what the in-plane longitudinal strains should be in the X and Y directions. Okay, pretty cool. And then, yeah, of, co of course, the the shear stress, shear strain relationship, you can just invert it. It's basically the same thing. You just, you know, take the coefficient and flip it on its head. Simple enough. Okay, so those are plane stress and plane strain constitutive relationships. Let's talk now about governing equations. And we talked about many governing equations over the past several weeks. We talked about compatibility. We talked about equilibrium. We talked about what we just covered in the last slide, these constitutive relationships between stress and strain, focusing in on the particular cases of equilibrium in a two-dimensional domain and compatibility in two dimensions. Remember the equilibrium equation? It was something that looked a little funny if we wrote it out in this kind of vector notation. It was, as I like to write it, this NABLA operator dotted with sigma plus a body force equals zero, which was a statement of the sum of forces at every point in the domain having to be equal to zero in every given direction that we care about. Now, for the purposes of solving these problems, we can kind of assume that if there's no dependence on the z-coordinate direction, if every slice through a given plane strain or plane stress problem looks the same, 
then any terms that involve partial derivatives with respect to z, we can just forget about it, just throw it away. And do we really care about equilibrium in the z direction? It'll involve terms that really either are all zero or, you know, for all intents and purposes, are not relevant for solving what's happening in the plane of deformation of this problem. So we can reduce our equilibrium equations, originally three, down to just two, involving partial derivatives only with respect to x and y. So that's nice. And then compatibility, we discussed this in a previous lecture where we derived exactly this expression that provided some constraints between the different components of in-plane strain subject to the limitation that the strain had to come from some displacement field. It had to be related to the displacement field through our regular strain displacement relationship. And we use that relationship to come up with this slightly different looking expression that basically still said the same thing, that strain and displacement have to be related through that relationship. Instead of writing it that way, however, we can write it just in terms of this one equation, kind of convenient. All right, so now that we have these terms, let's make a few modifications, make things a little interesting. Uh, first of all, let's start by modifying the compatibility relationship. And we'll start by introducing maybe a, a replacement of the shear strain component in this expression for compatibility and replace it instead by the shear stress. So just use our inverse constitutive relationship relating shear strain and shear stress and plug in what the shear strain should be in terms of shear stress. Nothing fancy. Now, uh, this should hopefully make good sense to you. And you'll understand why we're doing this in a moment. But just for the sake of argument, if we have two equilibrium equations, have to be satisfied at every point, yeah, yeah. If we have two equilibrium equations that are both equal to zero at every point in the domain, then it's kind of like we have two functions, let's say f1 and f2, that are equal to zero everywhere. And they exhibit nominally dependence on the in-plane coordinates x and y. So if we wanted to, we could take these two functions, both of them equal to zero everywhere, though. We could take them, and we could take their derivatives with respect to x and y, if we wanted to. We, I mean, again, why would we want to do this? You'll see in a moment. But we could do it, is all I'm saying. So given these two equations, the equilibrium equations, you could think of them as sum of forces in the x, sum of forces in the y. We could take their partial derivatives with respect to x and y, respectively, just for fun. And we'd come up with these ensuing relationships. And if we're taking the derivative of some function that's zero everywhere with respect to x or y, what's the derivative of zero with respect to anything? Just zero. So it's pretty trivial that we come up with this next relationship. So the derivative of these sum of forces in x and y, are, they're just zero. And again, just for more fun, let's add these two expressions together, just because we can. If we do that, we get something that looks kind of like this. And it's not really a statement of anything. It's not really a statement of equilibrium. It's just some manipulations. And it'll serve its purpose in the next step, where we recognize that the modified form of equilibrium that we just tweaked by replacing the component of shear strain with shear stress, and you know this kind of derivative plus you know the two versions of the equilibrium equations jammed together involves kind of a related term. There's this kind of second partial derivative of the shear stress with respect to x and y that shows up in both of these two equations. And you'll see where we're going with this, but really ultimately where we're going is we're trying to re-express the compatibility relationship in terms of not strains as we're used to expressing it, but instead in terms of stresses. And the way that we're gonna do this is Again, by kind of making these sequential substitutions and incorporating, you know, dependence on some of these other quantities like body forces. So to achieve that, we're really just going to modify this same ex existing expression for compatibility. So we want to replace this term by maybe rearranging terms in this equation and then kind of plugging it in. 
or equivalently taking this term and plugging it into this expression. Either way, we're still expressing a statement of compatibility. That's important to remember. It's not an expression of equilibrium. It's just the compatibility equation that we're kind of massaging into this new format in terms of stresses. Okay. Now, some more derivation, some more steps, not particularly illuminating, just to say that if we have still some terms expressed in terms of longitudinal strain, we could use our plane stress or plane strain constitutive relationships to replace these strains in terms of stresses. And we could come up with this term being equivalent to either one of these two things. But the crucial thing to observe is just that they're different. Not the particulars of how they differ, but really that they are different. Depending on whether you're solving a problem in plane strain versus plane stress, the compatibility equation looks different if you write it out in terms of stresses. That's the distinction. Now, the final step, putting it all together, if we take all of those different things and jam it all together, we now have an expression of the compatibility equation for plane strain or plane stress, it'll be different, in terms of the stresses. And it'll involve second partial derivatives of you know, the stresses summed together with respect to x and y. It'll involve partial derivatives of the body force terms. And it'll involve actually some dependence on the material parameter nu, the Poisson's ratio, interestingly. And it differs depending on whether you're looking at plane stress or plane strain. If you like, you can consolidate all that down into just one uh, equivalent expression for compatibility expressed in terms of stresses only. And with this beta parameter, I don't know. It doesn't really have a name. I just called it beta. Maybe beta for Brian. I don't know. Beta could be one over, you know, one minus nu or one plus nu, depending on whether you're looking at plane strain or plane stress. So now we have all of our equilibrium and compatibility equations expressed exclusively in terms of stresses. And the reason that this is relevant is that now we've expressed all the solution fields of interest in terms of really just one solution field. It's not just stresses and strains and displacements. We've kind of boiled it down into just one solution field that we're looking for, the stress field, which has to satisfy equilibrium. It has to satisfy compatibility. It's sort of the inverse of the other way of looking at things where you're trying to represent everything in terms of displacement. You could certainly do that and kind of replace all these things in terms of displacement only, or you can take this approach. Do it all in terms of stress, if that's what you prefer. So that's kind of what you get expressing all these equations in terms of stresses. And it's also interesting to note if we say, oh, let's just suppose the body forces are relatively negligible compared to whatever external load that we might be putting on the body, maybe it doesn't really amount to much. So we can just assume it's close to zero, in which case it doesn't actually matter whether we're looking at plane stress or plane strain, that extra beta parameter just goes away. Uh, and, and the same set of equations can be solved for either plane stress or plane strain in terms of just stress, in plane stress. Okay, now how do we use this? Well, some clever person named Ari, I don't know exactly what kind of name Ari is, but uh, Ari came up with this kind of thing. So he was looking for solutions to exactly these equations. Elasticity problems in two dimensions, could be plane strain or plane stress. And he wanted to find solutions that satisfied both equilibrium, these two equations, and compatibility. And he was playing around with different things until eventually he kind of stumbled on something sort of genius. Uh, now, imagine, imagine that you just had some function. I don't know. I, I don't know where he came up with this. It's just kind of a moment of, of divine inspiration or something like that. He just came up with this function and said, oh, let's just say, I don't know, there's some scalar function. And by scalar, I just mean it, it's not a tensor, it's not a vector, it's just a single valued function that might vary with respect to x and y. And let's say, just for fun, that uh, we can define the stress components 
as of as the second partial derivatives of this generating function. This function, named after Airy, is the so-called Airy stress function. So called obviously because we just get the stress components by taking partial derivatives of this thing, second partial derivatives with respect to x and y and different combinations, and we get back some candidate guess of what we think the stress field should look like in terms of each of these different components. And the magical thing about Aries stress function is that it actually trivially satisfies the equilibrium equations. By construction, if you say, well, I now have my equilibrium equations expressed in terms of partial derivatives of the stress components with respect to x and y and whatever. If I plug in these expressions, which exhibit this kind of dependence on coming from the Aries stress function, they're partial derivatives of this function. And if I evaluate both of these things, then I'll get a term, at least for this particular contribution, that actually cancels out with this second term. And the same thing happens for this second equilibrium equation, somewhat magically. But what's cool about this is now, rather than having to solve equilibrium and compatibility, you can suppose that the solution looks kind of like this, that maybe there's a solution out there that can be generated from this function. We don't really know exactly what it looks like at this point, but if we suppose that it has this form, then we automatically satisfy equilibrium. We can just say it's satisfied. We don't have to check it. We don't have to do anything. All we have to do is figure out, does it satisfy compatibility? That's the only thing you have to do, which is still a non-trivial exercise, but in certain special circumstances, it turns out that's also somewhat trivial. So this is the, really the cool thing about Aries stress function is we've kind of taken this really complicated or potentially really complicated problem of solving this infinite dimensional problem for what's the displacement field or the stress field at every point in the domain. And it has these different components and we could independently try to figure out you know, different versions of this function that satisfy equilibrium and satisfy compatibility, but it's a lot of work. And at least from an analytical point of view, it's almost impossible. Folks like Ari, and I think others who kind of did similar things in extensions of the same concept into three dimensions, came up with this approach and it works pretty well for solving a lot of problems. And the remarkable thing is you can do everything in terms of just stress. You're solving just the stresses for this one function to represent all the different components in terms of just this one equation. A lot less work. It's kind of appealing, right? I would rather solve this than you know some of the stuff we were talking about earlier. So how do we use it? Okay, well, in order to use it, let's actually use it by way of example. And I like this particular example. They give this in the textbook and, uh, did anybody happen to read this particular chapter or get to this stage in the textbook? Chapter three, where they present this cantilever beam bending problem. Who's happened to read up to this point yet? Not yet? If not, then okay, then this is brand new. We, we, you know, we, can, we can dive into this. Uh, let's see, I, I think this presentation will be a little bit more illustrative. The textbook doesn't provide a lot of intuition behind what's going on. So hopefully this will be either a good supplement or maybe a good replacement for what they have. So let's imagine we have a particular boundary value problem, our very first plane stress boundary value problem, which we can idealize as plane stress because mm, let's just say that this thickness dimension T is really small compared to the in-plane dimensions of this plate. If we do that, we can idealize this problem by way of plane stress, Again, plane stress applies for these problems where the dimension through the thickness is relatively thin. And then we can solve everything as just an equivalent two-dimensional problem. And better yet, we can use Aries stress function to come up with the solution. Now, here's the fun part. Remember the exercise we did at the beginning of class? Let's come up with the boundary conditions for this. Let's come up with a well-posed boundary value problem. All right, so let's start us off. You know, who, what are some of the boundary conditions we should impose on this, you know, now two-dimensional boundary value problem? Assuming we don't care about defining what are the shear tractions or, you know, out-of-plane displacements, 
We only care about in-plane displacements or in-plane stresses and things like that. So where do we start? Displacement fixed along this boundary, yeah. So let's just say displacement along this edge is fully constrained. There's a lot of different ways we could actually prescribe this displacement. I'm actually gonna modify that slightly, but we'll get to exactly why I'm doing that in a moment. What about uh, you know these top and bottom edges? Are there any boundary conditions defined there? Well, it, de it depends on your interpretation of what I mean by boundary condition. If what I mean is, are there any loads applied here? Then certainly the answer is no. But there are certainly boundary conditions. Every surface on the exterior of this body has to have a boundary condition defined there, even if it means there's just no load. What that implies is we are still prescribing the value of traction on that exterior surface. It just means that those values of traction have to be equal to zero on that surface. So for example, on this top surface, we can only really define what the values of traction are you know, relative to a, you know, the traction components exposed on that top surface with a normal that points straight up in the y direction. So the components of traction might look something like you know, traction in the x direction and traction in the y direction for in-plane two-dimensional problems. In that case, you can confine basically just the shear stress, sigma xy and sigma yy on this top face. And if I say there's no load applied there, it implies that sigma xy and sigma yy are zero along that whole top surface. The same is true along the bottom surface. And well, depending on your interpretation of what's going on here, you could think of there being certainly a shear traction maybe being defined on this surface here. But what about, uh, we're, we're not really doing anything to confine this outer surface at x equals zero, but we're not really applying any kind of load there. So even though really the only traction we're applying here that's non-zero is this you know, shear load, there is still a constraint on the normal stress acting on this cut face, which basically implies that sigma xx is constrained to be zero along this entire edge. So uh, what you see is just as important as what you don't see. Just bear that in mind as you're going through and defining boundary value problems. It helps you in kind of setting up all the right constraints. So we'll kind of jump ahead and suppose that we have these different constraints. Maybe we can define different ways of confining this you know, support condition. We could define, let's you know, constrain all of the displacements along this entire edge. X and Y, just set them all equal to zero. That would be perfectly valid. And in terms of how we define this, you know, shear traction. There's also many ways that we could define it, non-uniquely. If we say this, you know, sum of all of these tractions integrated over this surface, they all have to sum to this same equivalent load P, assuming P represents a force and not a traction, then there's really any number of different potential ways of representing this shear distribution on this surface. You might think, Maybe it's okay to actually define this as a constant shear traction. So you know it you know jumps up and then it goes you know at some constant value. Just take p divide by a, and then that's the distributed shear load that can be applied to the ends of this member. But there are reasons why that might not necessarily be a well-defined boundary value problem. Okay, but otherwise, suppose I I chose to do the following rather than actually. Defining displacements equals zero on this whole edge. Let's just say I'm trying to emulate the behavior of like a classical beam bending problem. Suppose I just picked one point and then held it fixed, prevented it from translating in any you know, x or y direction. And I also prevented it from rotating, which in some ways is equivalent to saying that you know, I could draw a little line segment or scratch. And I could say, just don't let this line segment rotate relative from its vertical orientation. This is not really equivalent to imposing a constraint on this component of, you know, or contribution to the total shear strain at this point. Or you could think of it as confining the slope of this or kind of relative angle of rotation associated with this line segment. 
So many ways you could think of it, confining rotation of this point and also confining its position. So ideally, fully constraining all you know, modes of rigid motion, translation and rotation. Now, is this a well-posed boundary value problem now that we've kind of at least set it up like this? It really depends. It really depends on kind of one thing in particular. Two things, actually. Perhaps we can spot them. Well, let me give you a hint. Well, if I'm just saying, you know, if I'm not directly saying what the shear traction should be along this whole edge, I'm just saying that in summation, like the net shear force should be equal to P, but I'm not being specific about what that shear traction distribution looks like. Do I have a well-posed boundary value problem in that case? No. In fact, we don't. If we're not being specific about how the shear traction varies, we're just saying, oh, you know, maybe like I'm just defining the resultant force or the resultant moment on the exterior surface. That was good enough in things like classical mechanics of materials and statics and things like that, where all you cared about were these force resultants and resultant moments and things. Now in the theory of elasticity and solving these boundary value problems, it's not good enough. We need to be specific. We need to define at every point on the boundary, what is the shear traction as it varies along this full surface? There's also another kind of glaring issue here. If I say I'm going to constrain what's this kind of displacement of this single point, and then I just don't say anything about what's happening along this kind of support reaction location, am I doing something wrong? Am I violating well-posedness of my boundary value problem in, in just omitting to define what the support reactions look like or the distribution of stress that would act otherwise along this surface. Let's say I only confine the displacement of this single point. It's still kind of a portion of the boundary, but it's kind of a confined subset of the boundary. So it's really just this one point where I'm prescribing these displacement conditions. Forget about the hatched region. It kind of looks like just this one point is constrained, almost like I'm imposing a concentrated force and concentrated moment to impose some you know, reaction at, you know, collocated right at this point. And then everywhere else, I'm not really doing anything. Uh, you know, who's to say what's there? Is that allowed? No, you, you, we have to be specific. Again, we have to actually define what is going on on this surface. We could say there's zero traction everywhere else and then really truly represent these reaction forces as you know, concentrated forces and a concentrated moment acting solely at this point. Uh, but you never really want to do that in these elasticity problems. You don't want to deal with concentrated forces and moments when you're solving these equilibrium problems. There are situations where that comes up, and it's good to represent it, but usually in doing so, you introduce a stress singularity. The stress zooms off to some almost infinite value at that concentrated load location, and it doesn't really provide you with a lot of physical intuition or understanding of what a real problem would look like under those loading conditions. So instead, it really is a good idea to try to distribute the load over this full boundary. And we can make some guesses, but the beauty of this is that we can choose anything we want. This is our boundary value problem. We could, you know, even though we have to be specific, we can be specific to our advantage. We could say, oh, well, maybe I have to define this shear traction distribution, but I can make it look like something I like. Maybe, uh, maybe I can make it look like a parabola. If you remember from your mechanics of materials class or strength of materials class, what does the shear stress distribution look like on maybe some kind of beam in transverse loading? You know, varying through the depth of the beam. How, how does the shear stress typically vary if you're solving problems through the classical approach as presented through mechanics and materials? 
Say again. Well, that would be true for uh, if, if we're looking at the normal stresses that would be induced by, let's say, bending forces. But if we're looking at the shear forces, the tangential forces acting on this cross section, how did we find that out? Or more specifically, what did it look like? Is this a subject that you're kind of previously maybe have familiarity with? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's in there somewhere. I think I heard it. Maybe a parabola? Yeah? Okay. There's some agreement here. We, we could uh, maybe define the variation in shear stress as some kind of parabolic variation. Zero at the end, and zero because we kind of have to respect the fact that on these top and bottom surfaces, we want to satisfy our boundary conditions on the stress. The shear stress on this top surface has to be equal to zero, as on the bottom surface. And if the shear stress is the same by the symmetry of the stress tensor, then at this specific point, if I'm saying shear stress should be zero right there, then so too should the shear stress on this face be zero. So if we're going to come up with some guess of how the shear traction should vary on this surface, we really should respect our other boundary conditions. We really should make it such that it's zero at the top and bottom, and maybe it like gets bigger along the interior. And a parabolic variation is really the simplest kind of thing that exactly satisfies that. So let's just go with that. Now, <clears throat> on this surface, we could do the same thing. We could just say, well, let's also define the same variation in shear traction. Because if you were to try to solve this problem just by statics alone, you would say, well, here's a shear traction. There should be some kind of reaction force. Also, equal and opposite magnitude in order to satisfy basic requirements of equilibrium, just applying you know, familiar concepts from statics. You can take sum of forces as you normally would, and you can figure out that there should be also a similar shear traction. We can distribute it in the same way, so it should look the same, also kind of parabolic in form such that it satisfies, again, the same stress boundary conditions on the shear stress on the top and bottom surfaces. But the last thing we need to do is figure out what should the normal stress distribution look like through the depth of the beam near this kind of sub nominal support location. We have to define it as something. Have to define it as something. And ideally, we should define it in such a way that, you know, even if we're trying to constrain this point, then this point really shouldn't have to do any work. Ideally, there shouldn't really be any need to introduce a concentrated force or moment at this point. So let's just let the, this distributed traction do all the work for us. We want to come up with some distribution or variation of normal stress that varies through the depth of this beam, which satisfies the equilibrium. Again, we can take sum of forces, sum of moments on this you know, cantilever beam. And we could come up with what's the resultant moment that we would have to apply to this end in order for some of moments on this whole thing to be equal to zero. And using that, we can maybe make some assumptions, maybe impose some restrictions, or maybe use our familiar linear bending distribution and say, let's just suppose that the bending distribution, the bending stresses will vary linearly through the depth of the beam. It's what we're familiar with. Let's go with what we know. If we do that, then we come up with a fully prescribed and well-posed boundary value problem. Now, we've been fully specific. We had to precisely define what are the tractions you know, on all faces of this block. And in doing so, we've kind of made specific our solution. Now, we could also take into consideration that we're imposing some displacement boundary conditions here but it doesn't really matter. If all we're really solving for are the stresses by way of the airy stress function, then it doesn't really matter if we're imposing these displacement boundary conditions in the end. As long as the stresses are in equilibrium, we can still find a solution, even though it won't have a unique solution for the displacement field. It'll still satisfy compatibility, and it'll still satisfy equilibrium. Kind of weird, but these types of problems that involve just trying to prescribe only tractions on the boundary have a particular name. They're called Neumann boundary value problems, which are really ill-posed boundary value problems, at least according to you know, the mathematical definition. But 
if we suppose that all we care about, the solution field being the stress field, that's uniquely defined regardless of you know, whether there's a rigid motion involved. So we can still solve uniquely for just the stress field, but if it comes to trying to figure out the displacement field, it's, it's, you, you gotta be specific. You have to introduce these additional displacement boundary conditions in order to be able to uniquely solve for what's the resulting displacement field that would give rise to this stress field. So some subtleties, and the book doesn't really go into those details, but it's really important to be specific. Okay. Now, let's actually use this airy stress function thing, hopefully in, in a limited amount of time. We have about 10 minutes. I think we could get through it. So what's the general procedure? And, the, and this is a pretty general procedure. You can use this in a homework problem or in a way that is sort of formulaic in terms of how you'd applied it. The idea is this. Assuming that we have you know, this boundary value problem, and given these you know, different constraints that we have to satisfy, you know, equilibrium we got for free, it's automatically satisfied if we're deriving our expressions for the stress components directly from this airy stress function. So we don't have to double check that or do anything to solve that. The only equation we have to solve is this, compatibility, which has this funny form now once we kind of plug in or substitute the expressions for the stress in terms of the airy stress function. This equation has a kind of equally funny name, the biharmonic equation. There's a related equation, the harmonic equation, that involves nabla squared times some function equals zero. That's the harmonic equation. The biharmonic equation is now nabla to the fourth of that function equals zero. They're kind of related concepts, but biharmonic equations show up in this particular case. So how do we approach this problem? How do we solve this problem? We can do it sequentially in the following way. First, pick one of the stress fields. Let's say the shear stress field. And let's come up with an initial guess of what we think it should look like given our imposed boundary conditions. So in order to satisfy the boundary conditions that we defined previously, remember what they looked like. They looked kind of like this. And to make this a little clearer, specifically looking at the shear stress. The shear stress has to be zero on the top and bottom surfaces of this beam. And it has to vary quadratically through the depth, you know, such that it's still zero at the top and bottom surfaces. This assumed distribution of shear stress on both of these faces is identical by way of construction of this problem. I got to choose it, and I chose wisely. Now, if this is the case, notice that this expression, the same in both cases, has only dependence on y, so there's no dependence on axial coordinate x along the length of the beam. So in other words, I could maybe reasonably guess that this distribution of shear stress will be the same at every cross section through the length or axial coordinate of this beam. And in doing so, I could say this representation of the stress field, which happens to already satisfy my other stress boundary conditions on shear traction, let's just take a guess that it is equal to exactly this function everywhere throughout the body. And if I do that, then I can say, well, let's now, figure out, can I use this function, this guess for what the shear distribution looks like, and go backwards? I want to find out what's the airy stress function that gave me this stress. And it's related through this differential relationship. The shear stress is equal to minus the second partial derivative of the airy stress function with respect to x and y. If I wanted to find what's the airy stress function given sigma x, y, well, I could integrate this expression twice, first with respect to y, then with respect to x, or the reverse, first with respect to y, then x. It doesn't matter. In any case, we can represent the airy stress function or our initial guess of what it should look like by taking this function, integrating it twice with respect to x and y, and maybe introducing some additional constants slash functions of integration. And we introduce these functions to be fully general 
accommodating the fact that maybe when we integrate with respect to y, there might still be some function that varies with x, which when we take this derivative of that integrated term would go away otherwise. And do the same thing when we integrate with respect to x. So we introduce these two generic functions, f and g, each varying with respect to x and y. And we now come up with our candidate expression to represent the airy stress function. We can plug that in now and say, now that I know some guess of what I think the airy stress function should look like, now I can use these forward relationships, take other partial derivatives of this function with respect to second derivative with respect to y gives me the xx stress. Second derivative of the airy stress function with respect to x twice gives me the yy stress. And in doing so, I get these resulting expressions for the xx stress and yy stress. Now, what's interesting is, you know, I get some term that actually looks quite familiar. This is actually somewhat consistent with my existing boundary conditions that I've imposed on specifically this face of the beam. But I still have to enforce my other boundary conditions on the stresses. And to do that, I have to remember what were those boundary conditions on these other components of normal stress, sigma yy and sigma xx. On the top and bottom faces, remember, I said that sigma yy was zero on both of those faces over the full length of the top and bottom surfaces. So if I'm looking at this function, sigma yy, and I see that uh, maybe there's some dependence on this function f that has variation only with respect to x, then really the only way for me to satisfy these boundary conditions is to just say that this function f or its second partial derivative, or you know, let's just say f itself, is just zero. So we can get rid of it, and in that way, we can enforce our boundary conditions on the yy stress on the top and bottom surfaces. Now, for the other condition, constraints on sigma xx, well, I know I'm not confining what's the stress on this surface. Or in other words, I'm saying that this normal stress, sigma xx, along this face should be zero. Do I get that when I plug this into this expression that came from, again, taking the partial derivative of the airy stress function with respect to y? Well, if I plug in y, this whole thing, or rather, if I plug in x equals 0, this whole term goes away. And the only way for me to get that whole distribution to be 0 on this whole surface is to set this function g equals to 0. So kind of trivially, I just get rid of f and g entirely. And I conclude that I have this now airy stress function that satisfies all of my stress boundary conditions and which you know at least satisfies this relationship and by derivation also satisfies this relationship to determine the stresses. This stress field automatically satisfies equilibrium. That's by construction. That's by virtue of using the airy stress function construct. I get equilibrium for free. What I don't get is compatibility. I still have to check that compatibility is satisfied. But that's not so hard to do in this particular case. I have now these expressions for sigma xx, sigma yy, and sigma xy, taken as second partial derivatives of this airy stress function. I can take more derivatives of these terms, or you know, more derivatives of the airy stress function, plug it into this representation of compatibility expressed via the biharmonic equation, and I can verify whether I satisfy this equation or not. In this particular example, it's rather easy to do because we notice you know, these functional dependence of this resulting airy stress function involves x, y cubed and x, y. If I take in the biharmonic equation, what are effectively fourth order derivatives of this function, most of those terms will go away. In fact, all of them will go away. Take you know, the fourth order derivative with respect to x. You know, there's no terms involving x to the fourth, so that's zero. Same thing, if I take fourth order derivative with respect to y, that's also, there's no y to the fourth term. And there's no mixed term that says x squared, y squared. So the second mixed partial derivatives with respect to x squared and y squared goes away. And 
I trivially satisfy my compatibility requirement. Fascinatingly, this is always the case for certain low order representations of a stress field that can be expressed in terms of any combination of this collection of polynomial terms. If I choose to represent my stress field, or rather my ARI stress function, in terms of this set of polynomials, maybe multiplied by some coefficients and summed together, then I'll always get this trivially. All these terms basically have zero value, at least when I plug them into the compatibility equation. So that's pretty cool. If I have solutions that look like this, there's nothing fancy I have to do. I already satisfy equal or, or compatibility. So pretty cool. In doing so, I can go a few extra steps, figure out what are the strains given the stresses by my plain stress constitutive relationship, and I can do a few extra things to figure out what are the displacements. I won't bore you with the details. In the end, you know, it's a trivial matter or not so trivial, but you know, it takes a little extra work to get the displacements. Really, what I want you to focus on is the final result. This is the displacement field for that beam in that kind of bending mode that we've subjected to all these tractions. And I want you to ponder this for next time. We're gonna discuss this when we come back because we're out of time, but ponder this. Really, chew on this question. Does this resulting displacement field for this beam in bending, does this agree with what you think it should look like given your understanding of classical mechanics of materials and Euler-Bernoulli beam theory? Does it satisfy some of those things that maybe you remember, like plane sections remain planar and perpendicular to the centroidal axis? Think about it. We'll discuss when we return next week. All right. Thank you.